Good day. As is often the case in this particular conflict that we're now covering in Ukraine, in which has become the dominating topic of this uh, channel, at least for the time being, last 24 hours have produced little by way of exact information about what is going on on the Ukrainian battlefields. It's not always easy to get all the information together, but President Zelensky himself has now come out apparently and said that the situation in Bakhmut and Vugledar is very acute and um, one does get some information creeping out about some things happening in various parts of the battlefield. So um, I was reading a report, this is from Slavyangrad, as I said it's pro-Russian, some will accordingly treat it very sceptically, but on balance, as I've said many times, I found Slavyangrad to be a reliable source of information about the battlefields, or the situation on the battlefields. Anyway, they say that there was a Ukrainian attack, or at least an attempt by Ukraine to launch some kind of offensive in the northern Donbass, in the area of Liman, but that this offensive got bogged down and then pushed back under heavy artillery fire. It says that in the Bakhmut and Solidar area, the uh, Russians, the Wagner organization, is continuing to advance um, towards the villages of Razdolovka and Nikolaevka, which are to the northeast of Solidar, and um, that the Wagner organization is receiving a lot of artillery support from the Russian military. Um, it also claims that the Wagner forces are expanding their area of control near Kleshayevka. This is um, a, another village to the south, uh, southwest of Bakhmut, which the Russians, the Wagner organization captured some time ago. Apparently, the Wagner, Wagner assault troops are advancing along the Seversky Donetsk Donbass Canal and that they're pushing towards the villages of, well, the Wagner organization says Krasnoye Ivanovka, as I said, is the Ukrainian name for this village, and Stupochi, and this is being done in order to cut the highway leading into Bakhmut from the west, from the west, uh, from the town of Konstantinovka, ultimately from the town of Konstantinovka, which is one of the places that the Ukrainians um, still control in western Donbass, and which is a major logistical centre um, and operational command centre operated by Ukraine in Donbass. And um, again, we get more reports that um, there was more shelling of Donetsk city, that the Russians are continuing to consolidate control in the southeastern suburbs of Vugledar. By the way, I've come to the clear view on the topic of Vugledar, that reports that were appearing about two days ago that Vugladar was effectively surrounded are probably wrong. It seems that the Ukrainians are still able to send reinforcements and supplies to the, their troops who are holding their positions in Vugladar. But anyway, the Russians are continuing to um, um, consolidate in the southeastern suburbs of Vugladar, and the Ukrainian military has been forced, apparently, to transfer reinforcements to Vugladar from other areas of the battlefields, which are perhaps equally contested, either because they're running out of men in total, or because they are obliged, they're trying to set up, to build up forces in western and central Ukraine, um, to build up these three brigades with Western equipment, which I'm going to talk about shortly. And lastly, um, Slavyangrad 
says that um, the Russians are now working to prepare a new offensive in Orekhov. This is this uh, small town near um, in, in Zaporozhye region, which the Russians um, have um, occupied, uh, are, are, are trying to capture, and, but which they haven't, in fact, yet reached. And there's apparently lots of artillery operation going on there, lots of artillery fire. And um, overall, it seems that the Russians seem to be preparing some kind of further strike um, near or close to Orekhov, and Russian reconnaissance groups supposedly are continuing to operate deep behind Ukrainian lines in this area of Zaporozhye region. So that's the sort of information we're getting, not of great dramatic Russian breakthroughs, but of steady accumulating pressure on the Ukrainian front lines. And incidentally, I would add that um, other reports that I've seen speak of um, Wagner organization troops being now up fighting well within Krasnaya Gora, this village north of Bakhmut, lying between Bakhmut and Soledad, and this other place, Paraskovievka. I'm he says, probably getting his name wrong, but there is fighting still going on there. In fact, the Russians are pushing the Ukrainians hard in these places. And of course, once they've captured these two villages, and also um, Ivanovka to the west of Bakhmut, then we can speak, as I've said previously, about an encirclement of Ukrainian forces in Bakhmut, a final closing of the trap around the Ukrainian troops in Bakhmut. Now, about the situation in Vugledar and in Zaporozhye, uh, there's been lots of discussion. The Institute for the Study of War says that these are all operations that have been carried out by the Russians basically to probe Ukrainian defences. There was an article in The Guardian um, from a British journalist who went to the area, and um, that's to say the Zaporozhye, uh, southern Donbass area, spoke to Ukrainian commanders and troops. They're not, I should stress, he didn't actually go to the front lines, but he's, he says, he claims that the Ukrainians are talking about limited Russian forces being committed to this area of the battlefields. I'm still not entirely convinced about this. I'm not fully sure exactly what the Russians are planning, but it seems to me that the attack on Vugledar is a serious attack and that the Russians do actually eventually plan to capture this place and probably intend to do so within the next um, relatively short time period, though I'm not going to try to guess how long that's going to be. And of course, if the Russians are indeed planning some kind of offensive to capture Orekhov, then we can say that this isn't just a reconnaissance in force, it is something more serious. However, it's also important to say that so far as I can tell, the military units, the Russian military units that are engaging in all of these attacks in Bakhmut itself, north of Bakhmut, south of Bakhmut, around Solidar, in Vugladar, in uh, um, in and around Orekhov, these are not new formations brought into the war by the Russians since the start of that mobilization process that the Russians carried out back in September. These are units that have been engaged, these Russian units which have been engaged in the fighting in Ukraine for some time. The fighting, for example, in Vugladar, the main force Russian force involved in the fighting in Vugladar is appears to be a Russian Marine Brigade, Naval Infantry Brigade, brought 
to the battlefronts from the Pacific region. And that has been active in the conflict basically since the conflict began in its present form back in February. And if we're talking about Bakhmut, um, obviously, again, here, the Wagner organization and its assault forces that are carrying out these attacks around Bakhmut, they also have been involved in the fighting basically from its outset. Um, this is not to dispute the fact that large numbers of reservists who were called up in the September mobilization have rejoined or joined existing Russian units on the front line and have reinforced them and have brought them back up to strength from the position that they were in in the summer and early autumn when these uh, Russian military units had lost much of their strength because many of the contract soldiers basically quit the war after their contracts ran out and because of the inevitable casualties and losses that come from war. But, as I said, the key point is these are not yet new units. These are not entirely new formations equipped with new equipment thrown into the battle um, as part of some great sweeping Russian offensive. Maybe... The Russian plan is not to conduct such an offensive. Maybe the Russians are waiting to see what the Ukrainians are going to do with these three brigades that they're building up in western and central Ukraine. And, or alternatively, and this still remains my view, a offensive is indeed being worked on and the gathering of forces in Belarus is part of that and the gathering of forces in Belgorod is also part of that, and these operations in southern Donbass and in Zaporozhye are intended, if you like, to shape the battlefield, as military people like to say, in preparation for that offensive. The key question is what will happen when those 160,000 mobilised troops that the Russians are building up are brought into the war, and what exactly it is that the Russians intend to do when the major mechanised and tank forces that they're building up in and around Ukraine are committed to the battle. Alex Vashinin, one like me, has a military background, said that it would take around March before the, these reservists were fully trained up to engage in this war, you know, the, the new military formations that they've been enlisted into would learn the rudiments of how to fight and conduct operations, that the command staffs would be trained up to the necessary level. So it could be, I've gradually come round to the view that in fact, Vashinin is probably right and the offensive when he comes will probably happen in March. Uh, Vashidin made the point that the Russians have never allowed uh, political factors to determine their military timetable, at least since um, the events of uh, the spring and summer. And I suspect that this is probably correct. And as I said, that there will be at some point an offensive when all of these troops are finally ready. And when the Western powers talk about reinforcing Ukraine in advance of the Russian spring offensive, well, I suspect that this is also what they expect, that the Russians will be launching their big offensive in the spring. Now, that brings me back to the question of what are the Western powers doing with the forces, the equipment that they're sending. And there's been a lot of confusion about this. Now, I've seen reports in Russian media that some of the Leopard 2 tanks are already in Ukraine. That may be the case, um, but I've heard reports in the past about the presence 
of Leopard 2 tanks in Ukraine. They were appearing in the Russian media. Even Riba, the normally reliable Russian military blog site, which provides a lot of the information about the war, was covering those reports at the time of the Ukrainian offensive in Kherson region. They published a report that Leopard 2 tanks were present and were operating in Kherson region as part of that offensive. I thought at the time that might be the case. It turned out that it wasn't. I'm a little sceptical about the story that Leopard 2 tanks are already present in Ukraine. I suspect that what's happened is that some people have seen pictures of trailers carrying tanks around and have jumped to the conclusion that those are Leopard 2s when they're probably ordinary Ukrainian tanks of Soviet vintage. So there's, anyway, there's some of those reports. And the Ukrainians themselves are busy in a, undertaking a massive lobbying campaign. Um, uh, a Ukrainian ambassador has claimed that Ukraine has been promised a total of 321 tanks. Well, for the moment, there's no evidence that the Western powers have promised anything like that many. At the moment, the total number of tanks that they've been promised is 14 from Germany, 14 from Britain, and 31 from the United States, which will arrive at some indefinite time in the future. Nobody seems to know quite when. And that makes... 28 tanks that are definitely committed to Ukraine at the present time. And the German defence minister, Mr Pistorius, has apparently now come out and said that Germany has now run up against the limit of the number of tanks it can realistically send from its own stocks. The Bundeswehr has made it very clear that it's deeply unhappy about the fact that any of its tanks are being sent to Ukraine. It feels that the German military has been run down for many years and cannot afford to lose tanks. And by the way, as I've basically indicated from some of the articles in the Daily Telegraph that I've been reading, there's similar scepticism, though more quietly expressed on the part of the British military as well. And of course, the US military has been openly critical of the whole idea of sending its tanks, US tanks, to fight, to engage in this conflict in Ukraine. Now, Olaf Scholz spoke about two battalions of Leopard 2s being formed for Ukraine. Um, been suggested that this is somewhere in the region of 88 tanks in total. You should add the light French wheeled tanks to that number, though I doubt that they are going to be of very much use um, in attacking heavy fortified Russian lines. But anyway, that's what um, Schultz said. 88 Leopard, tank, Leopard 2 tanks wheeled tanks from France, and of course we've now got 109 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles and 40 Marder fighting, infantry fighting vehicles. And there's also British Bulldog armoured personnel carriers and a smorgasbord of uh, equipment and equipment, all kinds of self-propelled howitzers and all sorts of things all being assembled and put together in Western Ukraine. And it's now essentially confirmed that the intention is to create a force of three brigades. Three brigades operating all of this Western equipment. And for the moment, at least, there doesn't seem to be any plan going beyond that. 321 tanks may be the Ukrainian wish list, but at the moment they're not being they're not going to be provided with anything like that many. Now there's been a fair number of articles 
from Western writers, uh, military people, Scott Ritter, uh, Daniel Davis, talking about the logistical nightmare that Ukraine is going to face operating this complex smorgasbrod of different tanks and infantry vehicles and howitzers and uh, self-propelled howitzers and that sort of thing. And, of course, it's also the case that three brigades, Scott Ritter guesstimates that the total number of troops engage in these brigades will come to something like 20,000 men in total. Presumably that isn't just the people who will equip and operate these brigades, but the supply troops and logistical troops and maintenance troops and all of these people that um, participate in this kind of thing and are needed to keep brigades of this nature functioning. Well, 20,000 men equipped with around 100 tanks and 100 infantry fighting vehicles, 150 infantry fighting vehicles in total, all from different countries, all of them enormously maintenance heavy. In fact, despite all, of, all that we've heard, all the excitement, the energy, the discussion, the debate about these tank supplies, the way in which the supplies of these tanks are now spoken about as a game changer or have been spoken about as a game changer. It really isn't the enormous, powerful Western force, Western equipped force that some people are saying. And there's now been an article, even in the New York Times of all places, which appears to ex uh, acknowledge as much that these tanks are not going to be the silver bullet, they're not going to be the game changer in the war that they were presented as being a short time ago. And of course, three brigades, 20,000 men, is not, perhaps numerically at least, a decisively large force, given that we're talking about Russian forces that are now gathering in and around Ukraine, numbering perhaps half a million men, some suggest even more than that. So I just want to reiterate that point. Now, of course, Ukrainian officials have been going around heavily lobbying, as have their friends in the West, for more weapons. Um, I read a report today that Ukraine wants 24 F-16 fighter jets, that it wants, obviously, attack and missiles. I read an article in the Daily Telegraph by General Ben Hodges, ex-general, retired general Ben Hodges of the US military, who wants um, Ukraine to be supplied with attackums missiles so that it can take capture, recapture Crimea. And, well, we'll see whether eventually Ukraine gets this kind of equipment. I've been reading lots of things about problems involved in operating F-16s. The runways in Ukraine are in no condition to receive them. The runways could be easily targeted by Russian missiles, all those sort of things. Well, we'll see whether those weapons come. But again, 24 F-16 fighter jets is not going to change the course of the war, even if they are supplied. And, of course, the United States can make many more F-16s, it can supply vast numbers of equipment to Ukraine, it can do all kinds of things like that. But the more it commits to Ukraine, the greater the problems become. And it's become very, very clear to me that over the last couple of weeks, there's been growing doubts about this war, about the commitment to this war, expressed 
in elite circles, especially military elite circles within the United States. General Milley is openly sceptical. He says that there should be negotiations while there's still time. Um, the report I, the, the article I discussed in my video yesterday, the one in which um, Secretary of State Tony Blinken, a notable hardliner, was uh, interviewed by the journalist David Ignatius, uh, effectively conceded that the recapture of Crimea was beyond Ukraine's reach. And we've now had, and perhaps it's the most interesting development of all, a long 32-page study from uh, the RAND Corporation, which straightforwardly seems to be urging the United States to engage in some kind of peace settlement. Now, I am going to discuss this RAND Corporation study in some detail, but of course it's important to make clear what the RAND Corporation is, because the RAND Corporation is the U.S. government's, and specifically the Pentagon's, primary analytical center. They've been around for quite a long time. They carry out analysis and study of areas in conflict zones. They consider U.S. general policies. They come up with proposals. They provide an overview of the position. In other words, they're the people who step back and look at things and come back and report to senior U.S. officials and the U.S. government what they think is the overall direction of events and come up with proposals for what the U.S. should do. Now, Rand is not infallible. It can make serious mistakes, as many who followed its work know. And moreover, sometimes it's advice is disregarded. But for what it's worth, I get the sense that its reports do carry considerable weight within the US government and particularly within the Pentagon. And the key point to understand about this particular RAND study is that though it is hedged around by the need to conform to the orthodoxies, for example, it insists that Russia has been weakened as a result of this war. I see no evidence of this myself. On the contrary, what we see is the growing indications of the strong resilience of the Russian economy, the enormous build-up in Russia's defence capabilities that was discussed by the Russian leadership in a series of meetings that it had at the end of last year, which I've covered extensively in this programme. Anyway, what Rand is saying is that absolute victory by Ukraine is hardly realistic. It continues to say that absolute victory by Russia is improbable also, but we'll come to that in a moment. So, as I said, it's hedged around by um, the need to support current orthodoxies. It can't come out and say openly, Ukraine is losing the war. If it did that, I mean, it would not be taken seriously. And um, the people who wrote the report might suffer all kinds of career consequences. But what Rand is saying is that Ukraine cannot achieve, or is, it's unrealistic to believe that Ukraine can achieve absolute victory and, most importantly, prolongation of the war is contrary to the interests of the United States. It is working against US national interest. Now, that is the most crucial point in the entire RAND study. And it's all set out in one key paragraph. It's a 32-page study 
But there's one key paragraph which, to my mind, sets out the position most clearly, and I'm going to read it. Our analysis suggests that duration is the most important of the remaining dimensions for the United States. The negative consequences of a long war would be severe. To be clear, severe for the United States. So long as the war is ongoing, escalation risks will remain elevated. And elsewhere in the study, it discussed escalation risks, the possibility that the Russians might start retaliating against NATO territory and NATO assets if escalation continues out of control. And also that there is a real possibility if escalation continues that nuclear weapons might at some point be used. And there's quite an interesting discussion about that in the RAND study, which I'm not going to um, cover in this program. But then it goes on to say, um, duration and escalation risks are this, this, thus directly linked. Additionally, a longer war will continue to cause economic harm to Ukraine as well as to Europe and the global economy. For the United States, a longer war will entail both increased direct costs, such as more budgetary and military support to Ukraine, and increased opportunity costs in terms of pursuing other foreign policy priorities. What this is saying is that if the United States becomes fixated or continues to be fixated by the conflict in Ukraine, its attention will wander from what is happening in other areas around the world where American interests are engaged. And as the United States remains overinvested and overabsorbed in Ukraine, it could find its positions in other places around the world slipping. And at this in this particular place, this art, this RAND study doesn't talk about that in any detail. I think the name, the word China is mentioned just once in the entire RAND study, but one can easily see that what they're really talking about here is the US position in the Pacific and the challenge the United States is facing from China in the Pacific, and by the way, from other countries, North Korea as well. And of course, the Middle East too, where there's been a significant deterioration in the US position. But anyway, that's what the uh, RAND study is saying. Over-focus, over-concentration on Ukraine is weakening the US strategic position elsewhere. And then it goes on to say, more Ukrainians will suffer, and the upward pressure of on food and energy prices will continue whilst the war is ongoing. Now, that's an interesting admission, because it is the first admission from any agency I know connected, however indirectly, to the U United States government, that the inflationary pressures, which, to be clear, are still there, despite dips in inflation, which are normal, by the way, in any inflationary cycle, dips in inflation, headline inflation, that we've seen over the last few months, that inflation pressures will remain and persist so long as the war continues. And then he goes on to say, there are possible benefits to protracted conflict, a further weakening of Russia and the opportunity for Ukraine to make territorial gains. But the former no longer represents a significant benefit. Russia has already been weakened dramatically. And the latter is uncertain. More time might allow Russia to make gains. And the benefit of further Ukrainian territorial control is unimportant for the United States, but does not outweigh the consequences of a long war. As a very tangled sentence, what they're basically saying is that, yep, long war, conceivably, 
might re result in Ukraine regaining some more territory controlled by Russia, though they're most unlikely to be able to recapture all of it. And as we've seen, if you consider Crimea as part of the territory that the Russians supposedly occupy and which Ukraine wants to recapture, the emerging consensus in the United States is that Crimea is beyond reach, that Ukraine won't be able to recapture Crimea militarily and that it would be far too dangerous for Ukraine to try to do that given the presence of nuclear weapons, Russian nuclear weapons there. But in fact, what this very tangled sentence is actually saying is that the longer the war goes on, the greater the risk that it won't be Ukraine that gains territory, but that it is Russia that might gain territory. Um, it's, in other words, uh, more time might allow Russia to make gains. And of course that, to some extent at least, also contradicts the other part of this, as I said, rather tangled paragraph, that the war has actually weakened Russia. And the paragraph also makes the obvious point that really how much territory Ukraine controls is hardly a matter of existential importance to the United States itself. What is far more important for the United States is that it preserve its international position and that it avoids the dangers of a prolonged war. Now, the study then goes into a long discussion as to how the war might be ended. It talks about an armistice like the one in Korea, it, the, the one that brought the fighting in the Korean War to a stop. It talks about a peace settlement. It talks about all kinds of things. I'm not going to go into the details of what it says, but the key point in its proposals is that as part of a peace settlement which with Russia, which one senses the authors of the RAND study, um, that's their preferred option, that's what they would like to see. What they expect is that the United States will accept that Ukraine will not become a member of NATO. And in other words, that there will be a settlement of the conflict which will leave Ukraine outside NATO. It discusses, the RAND study discusses at some length what kind of, um, um, what kind of protections for Ukraine might be provided as part of this general peace settlement if Ukraine is left outside NATO, um, but clearly, as part of a peace settlement, it, it assumes that Ukraine would have to stay outside NATO. And going back to that interview that, that Tony Blinken gave to David Ignatius, uh, which I discussed in my programme yesterday, one can see that implicitly the United States seems to be edging towards a position where it finally grudgingly accepts that the possibility of Ukraine joining NATO has gone, that it's not realistic that if the United States continues to insist on this, the risks from this war will grow and the costs to the United States of this war will increase as well. Now, this is a very important study. I say important 
not because it might not, it will necessarily affect policy. That remains to be seen, but because it does show that there are growing doubts about this whole Ukrainian commitment at the very highest levels of the US government. There's clear voices now speaking out against it. And that, by the way, come, will bring me back eventually to these comments by Tony Blinken and Victoria Nuland, which I discussed yesterday and about which I want to say more soon. Now, let us take a step back, however, and think more about what the problems for the United States would be if there was a prolonged war in Ukraine. Now, the RAND study makes the point that Ukraine is now overwhelmingly dependent upon the United States. If US and Western support were withdrawn from Ukraine, it would collapse. Um, Ukraine's ability to defend itself, such as it was, has gone. <laughs> and here, perhaps, it's important to say that that ability was effectively destroyed in the first few weeks and months of the war. The Russians essentially destroyed Ukraine's army, its military capacity, its ability to defend itself on the strength of its own resources. And what we've been seeing over the last few days is more and more evidence that Ukraine's manpower resources are also becoming stretched. Now, I've been very careful, I am still very careful, about taking all of these reports about Ukrainian press gangs roaming Ukrainian cities and um, seizing people on the streets and in hospitals and in all sorts of places and bundling them off into the Ukrainian army. I, I'm being a little nervous about these reports because I'm not always able to confirm their provenance and I've seen lots of film which purports to show things like that happening but I'm never completely sure what the film actually shows and how the film was taken and things of that kind. But the Hungarian government has now come out and claimed that precisely that sort of thing appears to be happening in uh, Transcarpathia, where there is a Hungarian minority and Hungarians are being in, in, in this part of the world are being forced into the army in exactly that kind of way. And there is an accumulation of evidence, including from Ukrainian sources, which does suggest that Ukraine's latest mobilization exercise, there's been many, by the way, um, which has been ongoing now at a frenetic level over the last few weeks, is taking on these, frankly, rather extreme forms. Now, that does suggest a number of things. It suggests growing unwillingness on the part of at least a part of the Ukrainian population to serve in the military. Maybe reports of the enormous losses, the low survival chances of Ukrainian soldiers called into the army. Maybe those reports have circulated, rumours about it have circulated in Ukraine and maybe that's made many men more reluctant to serve in the army than before. But I'm also getting the sense, given the way in which Ukraine is frantically carrying out this mobilisation, and bear in mind this is a mobilisation that's taking place many months now after the start of the conflict back in February, um, that February of last year, um, the fact that Ukraine is forced to resort to these measures, well, it clearly does show, as I said, the reluctance of some Ukrainian men to serve in the military. But it also suggests that there are now manpower issues, genuine manpower issues within the Ukrainian army. When Ukraine carried out mobilizations in the spring of last year, it was building up its armed forces. It was increasing their size by multiples. 
and though the quality of much of the enlisted manpower was perhaps not especially high in terms of training, um, nonetheless, that did mean that by the end of the summer, Ukraine did outnumber the U Russian army by a significant degree, and this was the factor which enabled Ukraine to launch its offensives in Kharkiv and Kherson region. Well, I get the sense that this mobilization is different, that it's not so much any longer about building up the Ukrainian army to a greater extent, making it bigger than it previously was, but to plugging the gaps, to finding men that can be sent to plug the gaps caused by Ukraine's existing very high losses and to hold territory um, along this very extended front line given the mounting Russian pressure on every part of the front line. So it's a different quality of mobilization to the one that took place last year in the spring of last year. And of course it's no doubt true that the Ukrainians are indeed trying to hold some of their best people back in order to build up these three brigades. And it's also no doubt true that these people who are going to be trained to operate these reserves are going to get this training in the West. But as I said previously, we're talking about 20,000 men in these three brigades. And that in itself doesn't look that significant, given the, given the overwhelming strength of the Russian forces that are accumulating. And it also calls into question whether there's that many troops anyway that can be built up or retained by Ukraine in any other reserves that Ukraine might be trying to build up in the rear as well. So, a situation where Ukraine is becoming overwhelmingly dependent on the West, it's becoming dependent on the West economically, it's negotiating for another massive IMF loan, it continues to receive enormous financial support from the West, its economy would certainly have collapsed long ago into hyperinflation if it wasn't getting financial support from the West, the West seems to be paying many of the salaries of Ukrainian officials and Ukrainian military people. And of course, Ukraine is now becoming very, very heavily dependent indeed on the West for the weapons and the training it is receiving. And without, the, without those weapons and without all of that um, military support that comes with it, Ukraine would as I said, find it very impossible effectively to continue the war. So, here we come to what that means for the West, for the United States. Now, we've already seen, Brian Boletic has discussed this at enormous and superb length on the new Atlas, how the United States is struggling to keep up with Ukraine's demands. It's basically given up the idea of supplying artillery shells and artillery pieces to Ukraine in anything like the number that would be needed to match what the Russians are using on the battlefields. A Reuters report, which I discussed a few days ago, has essentially confirmed that, and that is based on advice given by a US official who spoke directly to Reuters and to other American uh, and to other Western uh, media outlets. So artillery, they've basically given up on. They're now supplying tanks and armored vehicles, but European armies are not particularly well supplied with tanks. Now, there's around two and a half thousand Leopard 2 tanks in um, the West, 
Western Europe, apparently, but not all of them can be transferred to Ukraine. The militaries themselves need some of these. European NATO militaries need some of these. Many of these tanks are apparently in poor condition. Um, so it may be that the actual number of tanks that can be supplied is not that great. And the United States has many more tanks. It's got many more infantry fighting vehicles. But then, of course, it's got global commitments. It's got commitments all around the world. And that is what the RAND Corporation study is talking about. And overinvestment in Ukraine will mean that the military posture of the United States in other places could be weakened. And we've already seen concerns expressed by the US Navy, which is up against China. There's concern that within six months or so, they said, the United States might have to make some difficult choices. Now, the United States could increase weapons production. Now, Brian Balletic has discussed how complex and tough doing that would actually be. It would be enormously costly to do that. But there are also significant economic costs to doing that. And that, in effect, is what this uh, RAND study is also hinting at when it says that, when it hints at inflation costs. Now, let's just discuss what happened in the 1960s when the United States found itself in something like the same situation. The United States found itself in the 1960s in an arms race, a nuclear arms race with the Soviets. The Soviets were undertaking a major build-up of their nuclear forces at that time. And China, as we know, is in the process of doing the same thing. So the United States was driven to try to match in the 1960s the major enormous build-up of Chinese nuclear, uh, of uh, uh, Soviet nuclear forces. And today, the United States faces a similar challenge from China and, by the way, Russia also, because the Russians are also up upgrading their nuclear forces. But on top of all of that, the United States in the 1960s had to fight the war in Vietnam. And that meant that they had to produce tanks, armoured vehicles, artillery shells, helicopters, bombs, all of these things. And what eventually happened is that costs spiralled out of control and the United States at the same time found that it had to commit ever larger sectors of its civilian economy, its manufacturing base, to producing weapons. And that caused American finances to deteriorate and it caused the US current account to go into deficit and that put pressure on the dollar, causing the French in particular, but the French and the Germans together to some extent, to start demanding payment in gold. And that put increasing pressures on the fixed rate exchange system, fixed exchange rate system, created at Bretton Woods in 1944, leading to its eventual collapse in 1971. And we've obviously been in that world of fiat currencies even more. And US leaders, and it's important to stress that this is a fundamental misconception about the Vietnam War, US leaders, not perhaps the people at the centre of decision-making in the White House and the National Security Council, but the US leadership class, the military in the Pentagon, the top people in the business community, um, big law, all of those sort of people, began to become concerned in the late 1960s, early 1970s, that the United States was overcommitted to Vietnam, that it was putting strains on the US economy, strains on US society, that it was leading the United States to invest a disproportionate part 
of its military power in Vietnam, losing ground at that time to the Soviets, and at the same time, it was undermining the economic position, the relative economic position of the United States relative to other powers. And one of the great myths about you, you, Vietnam, about the Vietnam conflict, uh, one of the legends, if you like, about the Vietnam conflict is that what changed US policy over Vietnam was the protest movement that eventually, very belatedly, emerged in the United States opposing the war. Well, it was a factor in causing the war to end, to causing the US to pull back from Vietnam. And undoubtedly, the opposition of large sections of US society to the idea of US soldiers being sent to fight in Vietnam did play a significant role. But what academic studies have shown is that the decisive voice in ending the US commitment to Vietnam did not come from those pressures. It came from within the elite, from within the leadership class, from within people, amongst people who were increasingly worried that Vietnam, as well as being a quagmire for the United States, was also a massive distraction from other more important things and was also undermining the economic and military foundations of American power at a time, as I said, when the United States was locked in an arms race, a nuclear arms race with the Soviet Union. And it was these people, these pressures from within the Pentagon, the business elite, the legal elite, always very influential in the United States, that fundamentally and ultimately pushed a change of course. Now, what this RAND study and the comments from the Pentagon seem to suggest is that same, the same concerns from the same sort of people are beginning to mount in the United States now. We are in a different world from the one in the 1960s. The United States relative to its competitors has a much smaller manufacturing base. It's going to struggle to keep up with the demands that Ukraine is making. And we've seen that there is no actual limit to Ukrainian demands. They're going to demand more and more weapons, machines, um, that there is no limit to what the Ukrainians will want. And the US industrial system is less geared to satisfying those needs than it was back in the 1960s. And of course, we no longer live in a world of fixed exchange rates, but inflationary pressures in the United States are already strong, significantly stronger than they were in the 1960s when the crisis eventually, the inflation crisis eventually began there. And the other thing is that, of course, if the United States has to divert more and more of its limited production capacity to producing weapons in order to keep up this war in Ukraine indefinitely against the Russians, well, that could cause US current account deficits to grow, uh, US budget deficits to grow. This at a time when inflationary pressures are already elevated and when interest rates, the trend in interest rates, has been rising. And I think that these people, people behind this RAND study, are gradually coming to the conclusion that this war is a bad investment and that it is unaffordable. Ukraine cannot achieve the kind of victory that some people are talking about.
it cannot realistically retake Crimea. Any attempt to do so would probably end in a defeat, and that would perhaps be a safer outcome for the United States than a Ukrainian victory, which might trigger the use by Russia of nuclear weapons. And the longer the war goes on, the more expensive and costly it becomes economically, the more it uses up time and resources that the United States needs to commit to other places, the greater the danger that the Russians might gain more territory, more ground, and might start winning. The more, the greater the danger. This is also, by the way, touched on in the RAND study. I'm not going to devote more time to it. The greater the danger that you, Western US alliances might come under greater stress and might eventually fracture. And overall, US interests are best served dissociating from the maximalist policies that the Ukrainians and their friends in the United States are insisting on, giving up on this idea of victory over Russia, looking for some kind of peace with Russia, a peace that would once and for all drop this contentious idea of expanding NATO to include Ukraine. Now, I come back to what I said. The political situation in the United States is different today from what it was in the 60s. These people that we're talking about, the people behind the RAND study, the military chiefs in the Pentagon, some of the big industrial groups, they are the same. They are essentially the same people that we saw in the 1960s. <clears throat> this time, we have a difference in the political class. The, the politicians. In the 1960s, back in the 1960s, the president, Lyndon Johnson, had been initially sceptical, or so it seems, about the commitment to Vietnam, that he was eventually won over to it, and he became gradually ever more obsessed with it. In this particular case, I have to say, my own feeling is that the president has been deeply committed to this conflict in Ukraine, ever since it started, that he was instrumental in getting it started, and that he is much more committed to the agenda of the hardliners, the neocons, than even Lyndon Johnson was in the 1960s. And the hardliners, the neocons, are much more entrenched in the key, the key agencies of the US government, the um, National Security Council, the State Department, parts of the intelligence community. That was the case in the 1960s. So it's going to be more difficult for the forces behind the RAND study to prevail, I suspect, than it was in the 1960s. But then again, we are at a fairly early stage probably in this conflict. We don't quite know how it's going to evolve. It could be that the Russian offensive in the spring will concentrate mines, particularly if Ukraine is pushed back. We don't know what the effect will be of Leopard 2 tanks being knocked out. Um, we don't know what feeling in Germany, how feeling in Germany is going to evolve, though I do get the sense that it is becoming increasingly antagonistic, hostile to the war. But we don't, for certain, know how things are going to develop. But I'm going to suggest that the comments by Blinken and Victoria Newland that I spoke about in my programme yesterday are in part a response to the pressure which is coming from these people, this group within the US elite, the military, the business community, the legal community, the people, in other words, behind the RAND study. 
And we see, as I said, it's quite clear if you read carefully, David Ignatius, the David Ignatius Blinken interview, that nominally at least, these people seem to be prepared. Even the hardliners, even Blinken, even Newland, are saying or are hinting that perhaps NATO membership for Ukraine is not such a good idea. And they seem to be accepting that the idea of you. Ukraine retaking Crimea is really not realistic and would be extremely dangerous to pursue. So that's why we have these strange signals from Blinken and from Newland. Blinken talking about a peace settlement which would leave Ukraine outside NATO Newland talking about a possible eventual relaxation. She doesn't speak, by the way, about a total lifting of the sanctions. The problem is, when you think about the proposals that Newland and Blinken are making, I think, and this is something I've been thinking about more over the last 24 hours, it's absolutely clear that their proposals are not intended to respond, to take forward the recommendations in the RAND report. They're intended to counter them. Because the idea seems to be, arm Ukraine to the maximum, get the Russians to agree to demilitarize Crimea, and then at the same time give the Russians some wishy-washy, unenforceable promises, like the many that have been made before, that Ukraine won't join NATO. Well, as I pointed out in my programme yesterday, and as I also further pointed out in a discussion I had about this proposal with Alex Christoforou on the Duran, which you can see, by the way, there's a video um, on are covering this very same proposal. Um, this is obviously unacceptable proposal from a Russian point of view. If Ukraine is rearmed to the level that Blinken and Newland suggest after as a result of a peace settlement, and if Crimea is demilitarized, what prevents Ukraine simply sending its tanks <laughs> into Crimea. It's got the army in place. Russia would not. It's easy to see how Ukraine could just reoccupy Crimea in this, again, face it without any resistance over the course of just a few days. And in that kind of scenario, it's not difficult to see how the Western powers, the United States, would quickly acknowledge the legality of what Ukraine has done, after all, they've shown no willingness up to now to abide by any agreements they've come to with the Russians on these sort of questions. And at that point, of course, it's quite likely that Ukraine would once again renew its bid to enter NATO and it would be accepted. <laughs> so um, there is no conceivable way that the Russians will accept these proposals. And Gavrilov and Peskov, um, one a senior diplomat in the foreign ministry, Peskov, Putin's spokesman, simply rejected these proposals out of hand. The fact that Newland was all but bragging about the destruction of the Nord Stream pipelines, a fact which, by the way, who was responsible for that has never been fully clarified. Anyway, that will have reinforced Russian doubts if, they, any, if any reinforcement were even needed, that this whole idea, this whole thing really has, this, is a, this simply isn't going to fly. And of course, the Russians have rejected these proposals completely out of hand. They're not even proposals in any true sense. So, there we are. 
it's not at the moment clear that the RAND study, that the concerns expressed by people like General Milley are going to get much traction in Washington, at least not for the time being. Uh, Russian officials have said that it's not going to be sanctions or diplomacy that's going to determine the outcome of the war. It is realities on the ground, and I have to say, I agree. In other words, the war will continue at least for the next few months. But it is interesting and important that elite opinion at least at some level, in the United States, is now showing some sign of turning against the war. I mean, it's only a part of the US elite. It's not the entirety of it. But we can see that they're starting to give an amber light, flashing an amber light, expressing worries that the United States is risking getting drawn into the same kind of intractable conflict that it found itself in in the 1960s in Vietnam with similar negative consequences for itself. Well, I suspect that that amber light will eventually become a red light. I suspect that at some point this debate will burst into the open in the United States. And at that point, any European leaders, especially the British, who have overcommitted themselves also to this conflict in Ukraine, could find themselves left high and dry. After all, the same has recently happened over Afghanistan. The United States overcommitted to Afghanistan. It spent vast amounts of money trying to hold on to Afghanistan under pressure, after 20 years, it abruptly pulled out. Now, this is a different type of conflict against a far more formidable adversary than the Taliban ever was. I doubt it will take 20 years. We'll see how long it does take. But, in my opinion, the clock is ticking. And, at some point, a genuine debate in the United States about the wisdom of this war will probably start to reach the surface. And I do wonder whether some of the European politicians who have overcommitted themselves are aware of the fact. Well, this is a slightly different program from the sort of programs that I usually do. As I said, we'll be probably reverting to more discussions about the state of the war itself um, in my next programme, but this is where I stop. Thank you for joining me again today. Um, more from me soon. Remember, you can find all our programmes on our various channels, Locals, Rumble, BitChute, Odyssey, Rockfin and Telegram. You can support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. You can also go to our shop and buy yourself the kind of magic, you know, things like our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our T-shirts and all those great things. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me again today. More from me soon.